Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I am delighted to introduce Amy Meltzer, who is the Mass Pollinator Network Steering Committee Co-Chair. And she also is um, part of Elders Climate Action. And with Elders Climate Action, she is she belongs to the research team and the Natural Solutions Working Group. And now I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Hi, everybody. We're really excited to see so many people showing up. Um, and really excited to hear Trevor speak, and I'm happy to be introducing him. Trevor is going to be discussing resilient landscapes for a changing climate. He's design and education manager at Weston Nurseries in Massachusetts. He holds several landscape certifications and is a past president and current trustee of the Ecological Landscape Alliance. He's an award-winning regenerative landscape designer specializing in green infrastructure, native plant design, habitat creation, and implementation of ecological design principles. He's passionate about the natural world, which inspires his commitment to sustainable landscaping practices in this era of climate change. Most recently, Trevor, along with the Weston Nurseries Grow Team, introduced Weston Rewilding, They've created an extensive list of locally sourced native plants, which they grow and make available to the public to help restore threatened plant communities. The plants are selected for their large ecological value and are grown without the use of neonics. And I'm very excited about this because I know that our local native plant nurseries have been having trouble keeping up with demand. And we now have another really high quality source of native plants at Weston Nurseries. So that's really good news. So some of the logistics for tonight, um, Trevor will speak for about an hour and that will be followed by a question and answer period. So if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. We're mostly planning to hold questions till he's finished giving his talk. Um, and also when he's done with his talk, you can raise your hand virtually. If I think we're gonna have enough people here where if you just raise your hand, I might not see you, but if you raise it virtually, you'll pop up to the screen that I can see. So everybody, thank you for being here. And Trevor, thanks so much for coming to speak with us. And you're on. I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up, spending your evening uh, with all of us. This is a, a great program and I'm very excited to, to be a part of. I've been looking forward to this uh, for quite a bit. And we have a great crew, so that is great. Um, I am just going to kind of get this going. Can I get a thumbs up if you're seeing my screen all right? Perfect. All right. So um, I will just kind of describe more about myself along the way. But the the gist beyond just kind of what you heard is I have been doing this uh, for over 20 years. And by this, I mean regenerative land care. And we'll kind of touch on regenerative land care. Um, but I've been doing this professionally for over 20 years. And like probably many or all of you have just uh, had a, a very deep connection uh, with the planet, you know, for an entire lifetime. Uh, it was instilled um, to me by my grandmother, uh, who would just take me out and teach me about all the things that I saw in the woods and would just sit there endlessly as I flipped over rocks. And that never really went away. Playing with worms and finding bugs and watching insects and just discovering nature has just been my passion ever since. So, let us get going. And like I said, I will describe more to you as we go along. So plant the change you wish to see in the world. So we talk a lot about um, plants. We talk a lot about climate change. And we talk a lot about uh, natives and what plants are right and what plants are wrong. I'm going to tell you right now that there really isn't, an, aside from an invasive, there really isn't a wrong plant. I am ad I advocate for native species, uh, and we're going to get into a little bit of that and what all that means. Uh, but I really advocate for the planet. This right here is one of my favorite ground covers uh, and lawn alternatives, the woodland strawberry. It is just great because, you know, grass turns green and brown, and this one will give you wonderful colors in the fall and has massive amounts of ecological benefit, which is what brought me to do what I did. When I started my business 20 years ago, it was, you know, I have chosen to be in a business that uh, involves the planet and works with the planet. So why would I not be organic and why would I not work in harmony with the planet? Uh, and that's what I've been advocating for ever since. And why wouldn't you want to plant a, a lawn alternative, you know, that can also just benefit Mother Nature herself? 
And why wouldn't you want to create scenarios where you can see a little guy like this staring at you in the morning? This is the AM sun as the uh, as the light was coming over the trees. And I just happened to be just checking out the garden and saw this little guy just overnighting uh, on Rudbeckia. And it was just just one of those things. And it's these moments um, that really make me love my job so much because these are just one in a kind moments. And that's what uh, so much of it is about uh, for me. So uh, Mother Nature will tell you if you're doing it right. One of the biggest questions is, Trev, am I doing this right? Oh, Trev, I don't know what I'm doing. How do I do this? What's going on? Mother Nature lets you know if you're doing it right. If you see this, this little fellow right here, the spotted salamander, you really know you're doing it right because the spotted salamander is actually an indicator species along with many amphibians. Um, and they are highly sensitive to any types of pollution. Uh, especially water pollution, but I mean, if you have if you have a lot of pollution in your area or on your property, uh, you will not have uh, any spotted salamanders. But if you see one like this cruising through your garden, then you know you are doing it right. And as I was saying, Mother Nature lets you know that you are doing doing it right. So you may watch a YouTube video, you may listen to me, you may try to be like, I still don't know. But if you're getting the results you want, then you are, and just follow that. Because like I said, Mother Nature will tell you. Of course, we all want to see this beautiful lady right here. And we all want to support her. The monarch has become the poster child for all things pollinator. Though she is, um, while yes, endangered, she is just one of many endangered pollinators. Um, she's absolutely beautiful. And I guess if you had to pick a poster child to rally around, you know, this is this is the one to do, but uh, as many of you may know, if you are into pollinators and the like, butterflies are some of the worst pollinators. They're some of the worst pollinators out there. They're beautiful. They're like flying flowers, but they are some of the worst pollinators out there. So back in 2021 and then again in 2023, I was on a national uh, conference call and I was on with people who were evacuated from wildfire and people who were evacuated from flood. People were evacuated from flood down south and then out in California. So like I had people from Texas staying with relatives in Tennessee and I had people uh, in California staying in hotels because they were evacuated from their neighborhoods and they were like, I'm taking this call from a hotel. You know, we, my entire neighborhood's weren't burning. I don't know what's going to happen when we get back. And like this really sank in because I was here, you know, in Massachusetts where, yes, we're known for our crazy weather. But, you know, I was on a call with climate refugees from the United States. Like when we think of climate refugees, we think of massive things happening elsewhere in the world tsunamis volcanoes you know the the massive droughts and things uh you know in that in in, in all of africa and in many of the the nations in africa you know we think of that and we think of that those those extreme events you know creating climate refugees but we've had and we continue to have right here in this country climate refugees uh and that really started to sink in and since 20 2021, like I said, it happened again in 23. It has just sunk in more and more. Uh, really, the interconnectedness of all of us and just the, uh, you know, just the severity of some of the weather events that we are witnessing. I mean, just before, um, just the other night, I was, you know, hearing about all the storms down south and in the in the middle of the country. And I I go out there and I speak often. So, you know, connecting with people out there and being like, hey, are you OK? I know this came through your area. It's just it's crazy. And the fact that we check in like that on each other now uh, to me is just a lot. But here in New England, we're in a very unique situation. So New England is actually warming faster than the rest of the world. I mean, I was just talking about the whole continent of Africa and you might think, oh, that's really hot there. You might think Australia was, you know, super dry and burning. So it's really hot there. But in, in reality, um, we are warming here in New England faster than the rest, the rest of the planet. And that has to do with ice flows and uh, the way storms and, and tides move. And it is it is something that we are never going to get back. We will never go back to the way it was when many of us were children. We will never, ever go back to the way it was when our grandparents were little. New England is never going to look the same. Now, we can either um, all really just stress out about that and throw our hands up and just 
hope and pray that the governments of the world are all actually going to agree or that all the companies of the world are going to put aside uh, profits and everything and help us. But I am going to advocate and I'm going to talk about on here and really hope to inspire you to just do it. We, If we all get together, then we can do it. And I really do believe that our, our backyards um, can help combat climate change. And I'm going to talk all about that. But with these changing climates, what does that mean for our New England and our native plants? Well, uh, we've had two, two winters in a row um, where native seeds may not have undergone the stratification period, that cold period that they need to germinate. In fact, uh, those of you who farm, many of your cover crops, I know in, in, in projects that I'm involved with, the cover crops didn't die. It never got cold enough. So now we have to, before planting season, we have to manage cover crops that didn't end up doing what we had planned on them doing. So without these native seeds um, stratifying and germinating, it is going to reduce our native plant populations. And then, you know, that over time can absolutely add up. Invasive plants um, from the south and invasive insects are going to move north. I've already had ticks on me this season. I mean, the, tick, the ticks didn't die back. Mosquitoes are already out. So the beautiful thing or what used to be beautiful about New England was that our winter was a reset button. Things would march up from the south. Insect populations would boom. And then we'd have a nice New England winter and that would just reset everything back to manageable levels. And that's not happening as much. Plants aren't dying back, even our cover crops, even the plants that, you know, we intend to seed. Um, and like I said, you know, tick problems and, and mosquito problems are, are not going to kind of, those populations aren't going to get knocked back. And that's going to lead to more and more uh, insect control. And that insect control too has its repercussions, especially on that spotted salamander. Bloom times and their, and their specialized pollinators which have evolved together over millennia are no longer going to coincide. And this is with hundreds of plants uh, in, our, in our ecosystem. Hundreds of native plants have evolved alongside either for the spring, being some of the first to bloom, uh, like skunk cabbage. You know, it, it comes up right through the snow and it puts out its bloom at the same time. It's specialized pollinator fly emerges from the mud. Like that's, that dance has been happening for millennia. Uh, on the other end, with our migrating birds and, and even the monarchs, like making sure that those blooms and those seeds are all timed uh, as they're, uh, as nature is expecting them is really important. And if all that stuff goes out of, out of whack, then our native plants won't get pollinated, resulting in fewer seeds. And our native pollinator populations are going to continue to plummet. So that timing uh, is is really specific is really specific in our climate, and that timing is changing faster than many of our flowers and our pollinators can adapt. Longer, hotter summers are really going to hurt uh, leaf peeping season. Uh, and then the one that really hits home in my house is that the warmer winters are going to decrease maple maple production. And the thought of you know, my great grandchildren never knowing the taste of real maple syrup just sends chills down my spine, as with everybody in my house. So that can't happen. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen, if nothing else. Um, some of the results with our changing climate are very subtle and things that we wouldn't think about. So the increased UV rays that are coming down and hitting our planet are actually disrupting the dragonfly population. And this is happening because with the inc increased UV rays, the patterns on the dragonfly's wings are changing. And because that is happening, the females are not recognizing the males. Mm -hmm. They're not, they, they're, that, that is not lining up anymore. And so our, our best mosquito protection, uh, I would argue, is actually threatened due to the changing in climate and changing in our atmosphere and the amount of UV light that is that is coming down. And not everybody loves to see this lady in their garden. I certainly do. I'd love to find her. But uh, this is something this is image represents something that we've actually done. Um, and and what's actually what is going on in our insect communities. So because we are afraid of the dark and we leave our porch lights on, we are in our garage lights and everything else, the lights all over our city and our towns. Because we are afraid of the dark, certain spiders 
have become very, you know, um, have taken advantage of that situation and have built their nests right near the porch lights and are actually collecting or catching an inordinate amount of insects. So that's actually throwing off the insect population. You couple that with the fact that many insects are drawn to the light and just fly around that light to exhaustion. Um, moths, you know, specifically, moths are evening pollinators. One of the better, they're better pollinators than butterflies. One of our evening pollinators, uh, their GPS is set to the moon. So when they mistake your porch light for the moon, it's not because they're stupid moths. Their GPS just keeps recalculating and they fly in endless circles until they finally die of exhaustion, which is just, you know, kind of heartbreaking. If you think about it, we think, oh, they're just moths or we think, oh, it's just a light. But when you add all those lights up, so, you know, our 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 being afraid of the dark is actually uh, throwing off the insect populations which are so vital to our bird populations and so vital to um, our our pollination, the pollination of our garden plants and our orchards and everything else. So it's really just amazing to me uh, to continue to learn how interconnected everything is and how something that seems as innocuous as forgetting to turn off the porch light really has a, you know, has a great effect over time. So I, I will argue that the days of landscaping for beauty alone are just all over. You have your landscape has to do more than just be pretty for you. Our current approach to landscaping and land care is akin to sending plastic, rubber, and steel to a factory without knowing who works there or what they need and hoping a car comes out the other side. Now you got to think about this because we are led into we, and by we I mean landscape professionals, and by we I mean you know, homeowners and gardeners at large are lured in by these brightly colored bags and bottles with all of these promises saying that's all we need to have the best garden ever. But do we need that? And landscape professionals and homeowners alike fall into these silver bullet four-step programs. Well, do you know that your soil needs more phosphorus? It might not. It probably doesn't need more nitrogen because if you've ever been out in the woods, you've never seen a nitrogen deficient plant in the woods. So obviously nature knows how to fix her own nitrogen. So it's this not knowing and this disconnection with the earth that is actually continuing um, or, or causing us to cause a whole lot of damage. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to go out there and become soil experts or horticulturists. Um, but I'm saying if you choose this as a career, then you definitely should hone your craft and know what you're doing. And if you are applying chemicals and sprays and sides and the like to your garden, it would be good to know really what the repercussions of that are. Just because it's organic doesn't mean that it's okay because it's still a side. So you need to, you need to think about, uh, I think we need to think about what we're doing because we're getting to, you know, we're getting to a very fine line uh, when it comes to the damage that we're doing. Which leads me to this. Our, when we talk about sustainability and we throw, we still throw this word around a lot. And when we say it in our heads, it means one thing. In our hearts, we're saying one thing. But our view of sustainability is extremely blurry, I feel. To me, I feel our actions, what we say and what we think we're saying or what we think we mean doesn't line up with our actions. Our actions say that sustainability means how much can I take without breaking it? How much can I take without ruining it totally? And that's, we have to stop practicing sustainability like that. So as I said in the beginning, I consider myself or I've called myself and live as a regenerative land care professional. So if you look at that bottom line and you talk about sustainability, think of it like having the flu. Think of our current climate situation, our current gardening and landscape situation, the way we treat our planet. If you think about that, like having the flu, you don't want to start practicing sustainability now. In fact, if we start practicing sustainability now, thousands of species are going to end up going extinct, the monarch probably being one of them. So what my what my approach is about, and if this is the one slide anybody remembers, this is the only slide I want you to care about. Um, what my approach is about and what I would like to encourage you to do is think about regeneration. Think about getting mother nature's systems back online. Just like I said, when you have the flu, you want to get better. You want to get healthy. You want to have your energy back. You want to have 
all of your faculties back and your senses back, and then you want to sustain. Then you want to talk about being healthy. So a regenerative land care professional looks at sustainability as a goal that we need to get to, not something that we're practicing now. Because what we're practicing now is going to lead to a lot more degradation before it levels off. So I believe that we need to get Mother Nature systems back online and then just get out of the way. How good are you as a designer? If the objects you design cause harm, destroy the environment or endanger children's health. This is a slide that I leave in for, I, I, well, I leave in, I have for uh, my professional talks and I left it in because it's absolutely true. I am a landscape designer. There are probably many of you on here, um, but for any landscape, uh, landscape professional or anybody who manipulates the land, you know, it's, again, it comes down to thinking about what you do. So I suggest, Plant the change you wish to see in the world. <coughs> this slide right here, this is one of my favorites because I teach pollinators to uh, second graders. And anytime I show this slide, I'm like, does anybody know a messy eater at home? And the hands just go up and everybody's got a story about some brother or sister who is just the worst and messiest eater ever. So that's why I, I absolutely love this picture. But that's the change I want to see in the world. So, yeah. We are going to definitely talk about natives. And to talk about natives, native plants and the like, we need to get on the same page as far as terms and definitions are concerned. Uh, because natives is very broad. And now we're starting to go to garden centers and see native sections and have all these native plants. And for those who can't see me, I'm using air quotes right there because uh, it, it's, it's, it gets very muddied. And the only, there isn't a right or wrong to native, but there is a, are we speaking the same language when we talk native? So let's just start native. Native plants are plants indigenous to a given area in geologic time. This includes plants that have developed, occur naturally, or existed over many years in an area. Native plants can be weeds. Native plants can be aggressive, but native plants are not invasive. However, the honeybee in this picture can be considered invasive, depending on your, your view of things. Weeds are just undesirable plants or a plant out of place or a perennial out of place, an annual out of place. Weeds can be native, like in this picture where we have the common milkweed, where if you ask anybody else in my house, it is a, uh, it is a weed. And so I have to fight to kind of keep some of it in the garden. Weeds can be aggressive like the common milkweed, and weeds can be invasive. Then we have aggressive plants. And this is a this is a term that people don't use and I would like people to start using because it's very important to denote what is an aggressive plant and what is what we're going to learn about as an invasive plant. So aggressive plants are plants that spread through the garden or the landscape faster than we would like. Aggressive plants may dominate, but they are not invasive as they do not harm the ecosystem. Aggressive plants like this Minarda in the picture can be considered weeds and they can be natives. So this picture of the Minarda was taken in my garden, which I just, it's now all coming up. And it has, it is at, at least a third bigger than it was last year. It has it is grown, spread exponentially in the garden. Um, it's not choking anything out. So yes, I do sometimes go in and edit, but it is aggressive. It is not invasive. Invasive is a specific um, designation. And it, an invasive plant is not native. It never is. It is from somewhere else and has been brought here for either on purpose or by accident, but it is considered invasive because it is a threat to agriculture, horticulture, humans, livestock, and our native ecosystems. So here we have a giant stand of Japanese knotweed. We all know what many of our invasive plants are, but what I found in the trade and just in just being out talking to people is that people use invasive and aggressive interchangeably. And so what you what you might be doing is if you call bee bomb invasive, you're going to give it, you know, you're, you're mislabeling it. 
And then somebody is going to say B bombs invasive. So it's important that we get these terms. Um, we get we get these terms down and we start using them correctly because invasive means it's going to hurt the environment. Aggressive means it's going to spread faster than you'd like it to. So then when we start talking about native plants, many people on here probably totally understand natives um, and, and a lot of the terminology that goes along with natives. But I just want to go over this anyway, um, just so again, we can be all on the same page and we can all speak properly. And if you're going to come to Western Nurseries and start talking about native plants, you will be using, you'll, you'll be using the terminology uh, to get you what it is you are looking for. So straight species is the original recipe. This is how it evolves and continues to evolve, evolve in nature. So here we have, um, we have Echinacea and we have Aquilegia. Many people don't know that the native Aquilegia is actually red and yellow because there are hundreds, if you know, at least hundreds of different kinds, sizes and shapes of Aquilegia. So straight species is how it naturally occurs in nature. Sometimes that aquilegia might be all yellow. Sometimes it's red and yellow. There are natural mutations that occur from generation to generation and from plant to plant. But these are all natural. This is how it, it presents if you find it in the wild. Then we have native R's, which is a lot of people, this is a term that many people know about, not fully understanding actually everything that it's about. So a native R is a cultivated variety of a species. So here we have again, equ Echinacea and Aquilegia. These plants have been cultivated for specific characteristics, double flowers, longer bloom time, shorter growth habit, etc. Now, there is nothing necessarily inherently wrong with a native R. What you need to know when you're dealing with native Rs is 90% of the time, something has been sacrificed to produce that plant. So for the instance, when it comes to the echinacea, you know, you know, say in these pictures, to change the color, to change the flower shape, you have now sacrificed the pollen count and the nectar count. And that usually happens. Anytime you change the flower, you're going to have to sacrifice the pollen and nectar count involved. The other piece that can happen is if you change the flower or the color too much, it becomes unrecognizable to any specialist or any species of pollinator that has evolved alongside it. For instance, that blue, aqua, I mean, the pink aquilegia up in the top corner uh, from Bluestone, any aquilegia pollinator specific is not going to recognize that flower from the one that you just saw before. Now, generalists might visit it, but when the generalists visit it, they're going to find that the nectar and pollen count has been reduced. So, it, Likewise, when you change the uh, leaf color of a plant, you also, uh, there, are, there also is kind of a, a yang to that. So the best example that I can give here, or the two best examples, would be uh, Penstem and Digitalis. The straight species has a green leaf. Husker red has a red leaf. The uh, geranium maculatum, our native geranium, has a green leaf. Is extremely beneficial to the environment. Geranium espresso has a red leaf. Do I love the red leaf? Absolutely. I love the red leaf of both, Husker's red and espresso. However, when you change the leaf color, you've now changed the chemical makeup of the leaf. It has increased anthrocyanins in it. You don't need to know all that, but I'm just letting you know. What that means is caterpillars and things that use that plant as a host plant are unable to digest those leaves. So will the pollinator still visit the flower? Absolutely. You know, does it still have ecological benefit? Certainly. But a native R does not hold the same ecological benefit as a native species. If you liken it to food, this is more processed food. And the more you process the food, the less the, the, you decrease the, the nutritional value of that food. So if you think about natives, straight species, that's like if you grew it in your backyard or you got it from a CSA or a farmer's market. Native R, this has been either cut and frozen or it has been pre-prepared for you. Does it mean that it's totally unhealthy? No, but it's not as healthy as what you would get from the store. 
The other term that I don't have in here that I want to bring up uh, that is you may or may not be aware of, uh, but it's very important to know and understand is the term native select. And that's a slide that I, I should have I, I need to remember to create for this. So a native select or a native selection is actually a naturally occurring mutation that has been isolated and then cloned. So if you think about just wandering through the woods, say, and you find, I don't know, button bush or even a, a viburnum that has amazing, amazing fall color or a much smaller habit, like it's just a shorter habit um, that has then been taken isolated and cloned so it can be that that habit can be kept maintained and repeated over and over again so that unlike a native r which is kind of cultivated this is a naturally occurring mutation so yes it is if you want to kind of weigh native r and native select native select would be a little more natural than a native r it's a little less laboratory and natural however as you clone it what you're doing is you're freezing it in time. So what we'll, what we're going to learn about is the um, the natural kind of mutations and selections that happen in the wild are extremely beneficial to our native plants and to the ecosystem. When you freeze a native plant in time, is it still beneficial? And are the are the pollen counts and everything still there? Uh, it hasn't been proven that they're not. So it still is beneficial, but it is frozen in time. So it's not as climate resilient, um, say, as something that continues to adapt. Uh, finally, uh, actually, I think I think we're good on that, and we'll skip into re eco regions. So eco regions, you may again, it's a term you may or may not be familiar with, and these are geographic areas determined by common geography, climate, plant communities. When I talk about native plants. This is usually how I refer to native plants. So many of us on this call, if not all of us, are in ecoregion 59, unless you're on the Cape um, or elsewhere further out in New England. But most of us are in ecoregion 59, which goes from southern Maine all the way down to New York. And if you think about it, that entire coastline is geologically very similar, climatologically. It's very similar. So all the, na the, 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 na the native plants that have evolved there evolve through that whole stretch. So this is the reason I said that this is important is when you start talking natives to somebody, you could talk natives to a person who believes anything within 50 to 100 mile radius of where you're standing right there. Native plants to another person may mean all of New England or just Massachusetts. Native plants to another person may just mean North America. So there's no wrong answer there, but when you're talking natives, it's good to kind of get on the same page with somebody so you're saying the same thing. Like I said, nobody's wrong, but it's good to be on the same page and know that you're working within similar parameters. Ecotype, this is, this is one of my favorites, uh, and this is what I was alluding to before. So locally adapted species growing grown in a specific region. Ecotypes are plants from, from seed, from local seed. Native plants, uh, native plant seeds gathered from local areas and grown from seed have characteristics of that area imprinted on their genome. They are better adapted to local conditions such as weather and soil, <clears throat> more so than plants grown outside of the region. So what does this mean? Well, that was all very scientific speak. The romantic version of it, which I like, is that, for instance, this um, this Asclepius in the in the picture, those seeds from last year have last year's weather. They those seeds know they have the memory of last year's rainy summer. They have the memory of the year before's heavy drought. So because they have that memory. If this coming summer is extremely wet, they are going to be ready for that. They're already kind of, they've already kind of run the fire drill um, or, you know, at least their, their parents did and they passed that memory down to them. So they've already been through it. They will be more adept to handle 
a, a heavy drought or a heavy wet uh, summer again, if we have that. So this is where ecotypic plants and ecotypic seed is extremely important. Now, you cannot necessarily go, including Western nurseries, where we grow, I want to say 25 species, but that's probably wrong, um, species of, of ecotypic plants, where we've collected the seeds from our own seed plots from the season, uh, the seasons before plants, et cetera. So those, we have ecotypic seed that we're growing out at Weston. Our goal is to eventually become 100% ecotypic. Now, the um, Northeast Seed Network is a, a community that I belong to. And the goal there is to isolate or figure out what, what plants are most in demand in the, in the marketplace and then find those plants within say eco region 59 and then grow out plots of those plants so there can be a constant seed supply a sustainable and responsibly sourced seed supply of ecotypic seed so it's getting there but you cannot necessarily create your entire garden that you want to create now with ecotypic seed so it's good to ask uh and it's good to keep it in mind but right now you cannot certainly go there another way to put this is um, a milkweed that is grown here in Massachusetts drops its eyes, where a milkweed that it was grown in uh, North Carolina doesn't necessarily have that. It doesn't drop its eyes. It doesn't have that memory. So if anybody on here is not necessarily from New England, say you're from the West Coast, you always have those memories of the West Coast that that's imprinted on your genome. You can be like, yeah, I've li even if you've lived here for 50 years, be like, I lived here for 50 years, but I grew up in California. And that's how people talk. That's how plants are too. You know, so that plant, you can say like, yeah, I'm a native plant to Massachusetts. However, I grew up in North Carolina and was brought up, you know, came up here. So that's kind of how the whole ecotype and ecotypic works. I hope that explained it well. There's a couple of different scenarios to help you break it down. Biodiversity. This is huge. This is huge for climate resilience. This is huge for eliminating uh, many of our undesirable practices within the landscape. Now, looking at this picture might freak some people on this call out. That This just may totally disrupt your sensibilities. However, this was a great example um, of biodiversity. So what happens here is a number of different things for the, for the planet and for the people. So when you have this much plant life and this much biomass in an area, uh, you are going to have, as far as, uh, say, insect predators and insect or insect pests. I don't like to use the word pest, but let's say undesirable insects. If you have undesirable insects attacking a certain plant with a whole lot of biodiversity, you are going to have that predator likely nearby. And so that is going to be your pest control. So you will not have to reach for sides. When you have this much biodiversity, you have root depths at many different depths in the soil, all drawing nutrition from different depths of the soil. Now, if you are one to leave the leaves, and if you are one to leave this biomass, all of those nutrients from all different depths of the soil are now going to be available to next year's crop. Because And so having all those different root depths, this is where turf kind of falls short because it has short roots and they're all, they're, they're really all hang at that same depth. So nothing's bringing any nutrition up from deeper in the soil. Furthermore, when you have all those roots at all those different root depths, what happens is when plants photosynthesize, they create sugar. They then push that sugar out through their roots to feed the soil life. So if you're feeding soil life at many different root depths, you are now going to have a, 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 a far more enriched and healthier soil and soil microbiome. So you're now you're, you're leaving your leaves or leaving the biomass, that's breaking down, that's adding nutrients. You have massive amounts of um, microorganisms in your soil microbiome, which gives you a lot much healthier plants and uh, stronger plants with stronger immune systems. So that's huge because now you need all, you don't even need fertilizer. Your garden is taking care of itself. 
Finally, with all those roots and all those root depths, you're you're allowing water because you have a, now you have a healthy soil microbiome. The water is following those roots. So now you're getting water further and further down into the soil. And with your healthy microbiome, your soil is able to hold massive amounts of water. So now you've created a climate resistant landscape, whether it be drought or whether it be um, deluge your soil will be able to hold that water, either hold it so it, you, we reduce flooding or hold it so your garden can go longer and longer in between rainstorms. So why natives? We just talked about natives. We talked about many of the terms used with natives, but why are we using natives anyway? Well, here is my best argument. And if this doesn't convince you, then let me know because I'll have to come up with a better argument. So here we have two geraniums. We have a greenhouse grown geranium there on the left. And we have our native geranium, geranium maculatum uh, on the right. Both are beautiful. Both will attract honeybees. This isn't hard. Honeybees kiss everybody. Some bumblebees might visit both because there are bumblebee generalists. There are plenty of bumblebee specialists, but there are bumblebee generalists. So you may get some to each. Now, for many people, they see this and they're like, look at me, I got a pollinator garden. Look at all these bees. The native geranium will attract the mining bee, the white line sphinx moth, the tussock moth. In fact, the native geranium will attract or support 27 different species of butterflies and moths, as well as all of those bees and flies listed above. So this is where, when I said I got into regenerative land care and I wanted to design with the earth, this is how, this is where my decision came because I have a plant that is beautiful to me and a plant that is beautiful to my client, but it only supports say two life forms. I can also plant this other plant, which is beautiful to me, beautiful to my client, and it also supports over 30 something different life forms. So why wouldn't I put that in there? Why wouldn't, you know, when you talk about benefits and reaping rewards, like why wouldn't I want to be the one to put that plant in there that's going to support so much life? So that's where my bend towards native plants kind of came and, and why I go that way, because it just, to me, feels like I, not only that I'm doing the right thing, but you know, like when we talk about getting mother nature systems back online, if we can support all these different species, you know, certainly why wouldn't we? And we as humans actually are able to make that choice. And that's what, that's what is so special about being human because you can actually choose, you know, plants are just going to grow how they're going to grow. Every other species on earth usually lives between life and death and survival in the middle and we get to make choices along the way so why don't we use that gift that we have and actually make some great choices for the rest of those species that don't have as many choices as we do so why does this all matter well i've already kind of told you but here we go sometimes it's obvious create a pollinator garden you know create plant bee bomb plant minarda plant lobelia so we can attract the hummingbirds that we want to see so bad so that we can support the pollinators. Yep, that's a good reason. And that's an obvious reason. Other times, not so much. Here we have cinnamon fern. Lovely picture taken by my friend Dan Wilder. Here we have that hummingbird. And here we have a hummingbird nest made of cinnamon fern down. You would not think, when we think hummingbirds, we think orange and red flowers. When we think hummingbirds, we think sugary nectar. When we think hummingbirds, we don't think of ferns in the shade. But that's because we're only thinking about one portion of the life cycle. So if you want more hummingbirds, if you want more butterflies, it is important to consider the entire life cycle, not just the nectar and pollen part of it. Where does that where does that insect or bird live and how does it live? 
And what does its larvae or its babies need? You know, we need to think about all that if we want to create that. Now, my yard and many of the yards that I tend are actually proof of this because over time, we've actually, you know, my client's yard or my yard has, my yard has way more butterflies than I, I live in Arlington. So I have neighbors on three sides and my yard has tons more butterflies than anybody else. We have more hummingbirds hang out in our yard than my neighbor's yard. And she's got three hummingbird feeders, but we just have, we have the plants in my yard. We have everything that that hummingbird is going to want uh, in this yard. So it's just, it, it has become uh, more of a wildlife sanctuary. When you come here and you visit, you are going to see my patios. You're going to see my my pond, and you're going to see lots and lots of native and even some and and some na non native plants. Um, but it's all it's all designed for the for the grand picture, the bigger result. Ninety eight million acres of native vegetation have been replaced by managed landscapes. Managed landscapes. What does that mean? That means your yard, my yard. That means golf courses, that means condominiums, that means big box stores, managed landscapes, no longer wild. So this is where Doug Tallamy's homegrown national park is built on, because that's 98 million acres. If we all get on the same page, uh, we can start restoring and creating habitat. So that 98 million acres is larger than all the national parks and all the land used in corn production in 2014 combined. So if you've ever been to a national park and you're like, wow, this is huge. This is the biggest area ever. Nope. Our suburbia is much larger than that. So this is where, when I said in the beginning, I am hoping to convince you to understand that your backyard or the backyards that you manage <clears throat> can actually have a huge hit impact on climate change and just on uh, restoring and supporting endangered species. So for instance, I see about 325 different uh, clients a year. I manage about 100 plus acres of landscape every year. That's just me. That's not the other designers. That's not anybody else at, at Western Nurseries. And that doesn't include any of the landscape companies that come to Western Nurseries, nor any of the people that visit the garden center. So if you took, say, all of Weston's, I want to say... 17,000, 20,000, you know, clients and all of them were putting in just one geranium maculatum. That's huge. You're going to have a massive, massive impact. So when I, that's why I can affect over a hundred acres a year. You might affect one eighth of an acre if that's all you have. That's all good. It might just be a balcony. That's cool too. But I mean, I vi recently visited a client who has three acres of lawn. That's not, that may as well just be a sandbox. A sandbox would actually probably support more life than that lawn is supporting. Studies have shown that use of non-native plants is linked to the decline of the abundance and diversity of insects. That decline of insects has resulted directly in the decline of the bird population. It takes 9,000 caterpillars to raise five chickadees. This is a statistic you've probably heard before, but when you think about it, because the chickadees are out right now, I see them in every yard that I go to, and I see them getting busy and, fl and flying around and doing their thing. That, that first clutch is going to be laid very soon, and they are going to need 9,000 caterpillars. And those caterpillars, unfortunately, are not on your non-native plants. Those caterpillars... If any, I'm sure if you you know read or looked at any Doug Tallamy, you know that those caterpillars are on our native trees and shrubs, or they're on our native plants, and that's why we need them because it's they're not going to find them, you know, on on some you know either cultivar or non-native. The plants you choose could absolutely save a species, like these three ladies right here. So these three ladies right here are three uh, native, locally native bumblebees that are either endangered or extinct across New England. So they're not extinct totally. They're locally extinct and they are definitely across New England endangered. Why are they endangered? Because they're specialists. They only, you know, visit a few flowers and due to habitat loss and those flowers 
not being as sexy as Green Wave Echinacea, they're starving. Uh, so we need to start thinking about, wow, the plant that I put in the ground might actually, in fact, if you put in any one of these 15, you don't need to memorize this because there's this list is on Dr. Gagir's uh, website. But if you put in any one of these plants, and these are plants that we use all the time, Penstem and Digitalis, I was just talking about it, Monarda, either Didyma or Fistulosa, all you need to do is put in one of these and you could you could keep one of those ladies or all of those ladies from going extinct locally. That's huge. The thought, the thought that you all you need to do is go out and buy a perennial, but why not buy a few, but just get a perennial, get it in your yard, and you could support something from going extinct. That makes you a superhero. If after this presentation, you want to wrap a sheet around and run around your house like you're flying, go ahead. I don't judge. <laughs> so the common misconceptions. These are the common misconceptions about native plants. Just as I thought, she's nothing but a common mobile vulgaris. Alice in Wonderland was my favorite cartoon and one of my favorite movies growing up, and it really still is. And this is when they were discussing that, uh, is Alice a weed or not? Well, here's the truth. Many people think that native plants are weeds. Here's the truth about them. Their bloom time is shorter, more often than not. That's why the cultivars have longer bloom times. One thing I forgot to mention about the cultivars, I knew I forgot something. It has yet to be found that any time a perennial, a native perennial, has been bred to be shorter, that anything has been sacrificed. <laughs> Excuse me. So, for instance, Joe Pie weed, six to eight feet tall. There are shorter versions, and has yet to been found, has yet to been discovered that by shortening that plant, breeding it for its height, has changed the pollen count or its ecological benefit. I knew I forgot something earlier. So there that is. So the bloom time is awfully sh often shorter on uh, native plants. This is true. Some varieties do seed about. I don't mind this. This is part of the paradigm that we're going to have to change. So I talk all the time about my asters. My asters don't show up the same way twice. Sometimes they're like a big river through my entire garden. Sometimes they're just in pockets, like they're being highlighted by a spotlight. Oftentimes at this time of year, as they're coming up, I will edit them because they are very happy where they are. So I will edit them out to make room for everybody else, but I don't necessarily eliminate them. But you have to understand that they might seed about. I don't mind that my columbine, my aquilegia, comes up in a different place every year. Doesn't bother me. I think it's cool. My garden's just kind of designing herself, and I love it. They do need water to get established. A lot, of, a lot of times I go out on a consultation and people will be like, I want native plants because I don't have to water them. I'm like, well, you do have to water them in the beginning. And they're like, no, you don't. You don't have to water native plants. Yes, you do. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to use rutabecchia as an example. Our lead grower, Kate West, uh, along with the other growers and even myself, growing uh, black-eyed Susans, which are a extremely drought-tolerant plant. Well, while they're growing at Weston, they may as well be at the Bellagio. They have an extremely bougie lifestyle. They're neonic free and they're 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 chemical and pesticide free. But I show up at five in the morning and I sing to them. Kate shows up at like six in the morning and she's singing to them and talking to them. And then everybody else shows up and everybody's just kind of giving them all this attention. And they have all the water and all the sun and all the everything they need. So think about yourself on vacation. Like when you've been on a cruise and all you have to do is put your hand in the air and boom, there's a drink and there's all this food that you could ever want everywhere you go. And then you come home and you're like, you put your hand in the air and no drink arrives. Uh, think of it like that. So when you take that Rude Becky home, that black eyed Susan comes home and it goes into your garden, she needs to remember that or be uh, kind of understand that vacation's over. And when she does, just like we all do, she'll get back into her routine and she'll understand being drought tolerant and she'll remember her role in, you know, within the landscape. But while she's been living at Weston, it's been a real cushy lifestyle. So when she gets to your garden, you're going to need to water her and kind of let her know that the cruise is over and now she's a player in your garden, which isn't a bad thing. It's just different than hanging out with Kate all day long. Once established, they do need less water. It's absolutely true. Once they once they have become a part of your landscape, your garden and the ecosystem, they need a lot less water. They need a lot less maintenance, fewer inputs. So you don't want to, you don't need to fertilize your native plants a whole lot because they don't like that. They like crappy New England soil. 
They evolved in crappy New England soil. It's what they like. They don't look messy. In fact, if that picture of biodiversity totally offended your sensibilities, one thing that, you know, that I do quite a bit of and uh, that I promote a whole lot are composed meadows, which is taking all that bi biodiversity that you saw in that picture and organizing it a little bit more. So you have all the biodiversity, but it's a little more readable to the eye and it doesn't look as air quote messy. They will attract wildlife and you don't get to choose. That is that is the big thing. Well, oftentimes people are like, I want to have a pollinator garden because I want lots of butterflies. I just don't want bees. Like, no, you don't get to choose. I'm sorry. There is a native plant for every situation. Sun, shade, lawn alternatives, wet, dry, which is what makes it so great because there is something that no matter what your yard looks like, no matter what your landscape or gardening goals are there is a native plant for you nibbling is okay if nothing's eating your garden something's gone wrong so here's the thing about nibbling and eating and i know i'm running a little bit long here so um if your plant is being decimated it is because your plant is unhealthy it is an insect's job to remove unhealthy plants from the from the landscape so if your plant is being decimated, now I'm not saying nibbled, if it's being decimated, it is because it is not it is not happy and it is the insect's job to get it out of there. If your plant is photosynthesizing properly and it has all the nutrients and all that perfect soil microbiome that we were talking about, then your plant through photosynthesis will create amino acids. Amino acids are complete proteins. If your plant is com is creating complete proteins, it is indigestible for these guys right here. Caterpillars can't eat it. If your plant is even healthier than that, and it has a healthy amount of lipids, fats in its leaves, it will become indigestible or not a good host to any kind of fungi. So you'll have less powdery mildew. And then if your plant is photosynthesizing and it has an extremely healthy immune system um, and it's creating, you know, it has the proteins and it has the lipids, it will eventually become indigestible to beetles as well. So if your plant is being decimated, and the example that I'll give uh, real quick is we have uh, perennial hibiscus on the side of the side of the parking lot at Weston Nurseries. Every single year, those hibiscus look like one of my grandmother's doilies. They are just totally skeletonized. They're not happy. They hate the soil. They hate the soil makeup. They hate all the salt that goes down over the winter. They are not happy. Do, are the blooms gorgeous? Yes. But the leaves, they're, they're essentially non-existent. Uh, we have yet to move them, but it's just a perfect example of how when your plant's not happy, it'll be decimated. Now, we have similar perennial hibiscus in other beds and they don't get nibbled at all. They're totally good to go and totally happy. So where do you start? Well, you start with why are you planting native plants? Are you doing it for low maintenance? Probably. Why not? Why wouldn't you? Everybody wants a low maintenance garden. These are the reasons right here that I get asked a lot. Low maintenance, habitat. I want habitat. I want pollinators. Pollinators are the big request right now. Many people want pollinators. That's exact. That's a great reason, as good a reason as any to start planting some native plants. Birds, that's another one. I plant a lot of bird gardens. Not as many as the pollinator gardens I put in, but I put in a lot of bird gardens. You do need to understand when you're planting your native plant gardens or when you're choosing your plants uh, at the garden center, natives, exotics, native R's and cultivars are not all the same as we talked about. They don't all carry the same ecological weight. There isn't a good and a bad, but you cannot buy a native R, for instance, any one of the trillion echinacea that are out there and think that is going to have the same nutritional value for a pollinator as the straight species. It's not a bad thing, just like some certain processed food isn't a bad thing, but it's not the same thing. So as long as you know that, then you're good to go. Native doesn't mean no maintenance because it is a managed landscape. The only way there's no maintenance is if you just let things go wild and you never touch them again. For as long as it's your garden and your yard, it is going to need some sort of maintenance. Having bees is a good thing. Happy bees don't sting. I teach that to my second graders all the time. I wander around in bees constantly. 
and I don't get stung. Why? Because happy bees don't sting. I'm not a threat to them. They're not a threat to me. Native gardens do look beautiful. And here is a place to start. So if you go to the Weston website under the native plant section, you are going to find seven very little teeny gardens. No, <laughs> what you will find is seven examples of different native plant gardens um, that uh, I designed a few years ago. We now have them up and now we're in full production of growing everything for them. So I'm not saying come to Weston because these are free for anybody. These went up online uh, because I want people to have a starting place. The way I view uh, native plants and the native plant kind of climate, I guess, I don't want to use climate as, again as a term, but the, the, the feeling around native plants is people want to use them. They just don't know how. And it's very much like a, a, a food that you're not familiar with, say an exotic food. For me, it's Indian. Do I like Indian food? Absolutely. Do, am I familiar enough with the ingredients to cook it well at home? No, not at all. Am I familiar enough with all the different dishes that when I go to a restaurant, I can look at it and be like, that I want to do that one because I love that one. No, I only know a handful of them. Am I willing to experiment with Indian food like I am with native plants? Absolutely. And I think we should. But this kind of gives you a few recipes to start with. And as you start working with the ingredients, you'll see how the ingredients go together. So here, the colors in the circles and the colors in the picture represent the bloom colors. So we have a garden on here, which is for a pollinator po powerhouse garden, which is great for all pollinators. We have one that's designed for endangered pollinators. We have one that's designed for hummingbirds. We have uh, one that's designed for the hell strip, which is the area between the sidewalk and the street that all the dogs pee on and that gets covered in salt. There are native plants for that area as well. So there's a number of different gardens on there all as a starter point, starting point. They're in a hundred square feet. So that, that garden right there is a hundred square feet. The numbers represented are the numbers of plants there. Feel free to design it however you want. This is just a suggestion. And you can also combine them. So if you want to combine the pollinator powerhouse garden with the hummingbird garden, then go right ahead and you can mix them together. They've all been designed for that. So these are all the plants selected here are um, have been picked for their ecological benefit. So if you want to start looking at plant lists of some of the most effective plants in the landscape, again, this is just a good starting point for you. There isn't any shame in liking exotic plants, though, just so you know, because like Heptacodium is one of my favorite small trees, large shrubs, uh, non-native, but I absolutely love it. I love the exfoliating bark. I love that it blooms in off times. I love the sepals. I love everything about that plant, but I also plant a lot of plants. So the, I love hellebore. My hellebore right now in my garden look amazing. Uh, it's one of my, uh, again, one of my favorite plants. Non-native, but it's a great one. And it's great for using in the landscape. So if you follow Doug Tallamy 70-30, you should be good. 70% native, 30% non-native. You know, you sh absolutely should be good to go. One, of the, one other piece that I want to mention about the native selects that I talked about way, way back is that if you are trying to design, I, I will choose native selects, um, especially when I'm doing like a residential or a foundation planting for somebody who wants natives, because the straight species might get to be eight to 12 feet tall, but the selection might get to be four to five feet tall. So I don't wanna, just for the sake of using natives, don't wanna put shrubs that wanna be really huge because then it'll look like pretty much every house that had a rhododendron put in in like the 60s and 70s. It's now up to the second story. So I don't want to do that to anybody. So these native selects are a great way to get natives into the landscape while still maintaining a proper sized, proportioned, uh, and low maintenance suburban landscape. So with that, I thank you all very much. It has been a pleasure. I just went a little bit over, but I would like to share this with you right now. That web address right there, Trevor S at WestonNurseries.com. I am absolutely available to help anybody. If you would like to start um, creating a native garden, if you would like tips on creating habitat and attracting different things to your yard, I'm certainly there for that. Every single Tuesday night from April to October from six to seven, I do a, it's Tuesdays with Trev. We just hang out and we talk gardens. We talk lawns, we talk vegetables, we talk natives, we talk climate change, we talk non-natives. 
anything you want to come. So people come and they bring their questions Tuesdays from six to seven, uh, or they come and just listen. Some people come, hang out, listen and learn. Other people come with a specific question, like how do I, this is my problem I'm having with my tomato, what do I do? Or how do I grow the best tomatoes ever? We talk about that too. So it's all on there, Tuesdays with Trev, six to seven on Tuesday nights. If you have a question that doesn't get answered tonight or you have a project that you're working on, please do reach out to me. I am 100% available to help you with your landscape goals. And with that, I thank you so much and we can take questions. Trevor, thanks. That is great. We've got some enthusiastic thanks in the chat, so we should save the chat and we can send that to you. Um, if Do you want to leave this up? If you stop screen sharing, I'm just thinking if people raise their hands. Yeah, I'm going to stop screen sharing hands. right now. Okay. Here we yeah, are. It'll be easier okay. to see people. So yeah. folks, if you can put questions in the chat, if you raise your hands, I can call on you. Can, you can ask the question directly. Um, that was great, Trevor. You covered so much territory and connected climate change with native plant gardening, with you know a design perspective as well as the ecological perspective. It was a great combination of information. So a couple questions we got. One of them is: um, Is it important to use peat-free compost, or does that not matter? Someone asked that. Uh, so yes, peat is not sustainable. So I absolutely recommend looking at your potting mixes, uh, looking at your compost, uh, looking at any of the ingredients you use and try to see if you can eliminate peat. There are plenty of companies that have come out with peat-free mixes of potting mix, uh, et cetera. So uh, any kind of peat moss is definitely something that you would, you know, that I suggest you shy away from because it's essentially your you know, you're destroying an entire ecosystem to benefit, you know, your peonies in your backyard. And that just doesn't, when you weigh that out in scale wise, it doesn't work, especially when there are other alternatives to use. Yeah, peat stores in a huge amount of carbon and peat bugs. So we're also releasing carbon when we dig it up. Exactly. Um, so we have another question. When is it safe to do garden cleanup? Okay, so uh, I'm, this is a great question. I love I love this question, and I'll just basically tell you how um, how I maintain my garden, and then you can adapt it to yours. So uh, for me, who is in the landscape starting in March, and I don't get back to my own landscape until about November, uh, I leave everything standing in the fall. Everything I leave all the leaves in the fall. I leave everything standing in the fall. This is to support the pollinators for the following season because many of the queen bumblebees live under that leaf litter and overwinter under that leaf litter. Other bees will live in the hollows of the stems that I leave behind. Uh, so that's all very important. Come spring, I still continue to leave things standing. Um, I am actually just going to start cutting stuff back uh, coming up. So I wait until I see bees flying around. I wait till I see the bumblebees because those are usually the early spring bumblebees are usually the queens. So once the queens have emerged, then I feel pretty comfortable that I can start moving the leaf litter around. So what I do to create the happy medium, because I'm, I'm trying to strike a balance here uh, within my household, what I do is I cut all my stems down to eight inches so that the, the nesting bees you know, can, can nest in the stems. I leave my beds about six feet deep, six to eight feet deep. So I leave the back four feet covered in the last year's leaves and all the biomass that I cut down. The front two feet, two to three feet, I edge and I mulch with a leaf mulch. So when you are looking at my garden in the next couple of weeks, when you look at my garden, you're going to see a beautifully edged bed with a very tiny small lawn for observing the gardens. And then you're gonna have about three feet of leaf mulch because that will, you know, eventually it'll, it'll break down and act as a slow release compost. And then behind all of that, I have all my perennials just coming up through the prior season's leaves uh, and biomass. So like I talked about before, all that biomass is gonna break down and add nutrients to my soil. It's gonna feed my, my soil microbiome. So I'm gonna have super healthy plants. Um, but yet at a glance, you know, especially in the beginning, you know, my garden looks pretty much like anybody else's garden. Um, it has a couple seasons where it looks awkward. 
kind of like a new haircut. I know I'm not one to be talking about haircuts, but it does look a little bit like a new haircut because you see all the leaves in the back and the mulch in the front. But by end of April, beginning of May, uh, all of the stuff has come up and you can't even see that anymore. So that is pretty much how I take my cues from nature. So once we have like a week or two of 50, 60 degree weather, then I start to see the pollinators moving around. Once they're moving around, I'm going to know that it should be pretty safe. And that's my window to kind of just get my garden all tidied up, prune everything that I need to do, lay everything down and go from there. Great. Okay, next question. Um, someone's asking about a front lawn alternative. She has full sun and it needs to be drought tolerant. She mentioned sedges and said she thinks they need moisture and shade, which is not her lawn. Uh, so some sedges will, you know, and you can, you can certainly, um, you know, do do the research. Some will take more um, more sun than others, and some are very drought tolerant. I mean, for dry shade, Pennsylvania Carex is amazing. Um, the Appalachian Carex takes a little more sun uh, than the Pennsylvania. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, Prunella and Antonella. So the Pussy Toes and Self Heal are also great alternatives if you're trying to kind of keep that you know, that lawn and lawn alternative balance, the non-native of adding clover uh, certainly doesn't hurt because it draws down the nitrogen. So it'll help keep your lawn and grass green. It's way more drought tolerant. So adding clover, to, more clover to your lawn, uh, not only brings you lots of luck, but it makes your lawn a lot more sustainable uh, and you can walk all over it. The wild strawberry that I showed in the beginning, relatively aggressive it'll grow fast and it'll fill in the area but you can walk all over it you can't necessarily have a soccer game on it but you certainly can walk all over it uh it does take a beating you certainly can mow it as well if you need to but it only gets to be about four inches high and so it's great for some of those unused portions and then you keep your turf for the air for your gathering spaces your play spaces uh and and the like so those are just a uh, just a handful of uh, lawn alternatives that you can use. We have, uh, I've written articles about it on, on the Weston blog and in the ELA too. So you can find all of that there. Great, I'm gonna take one more question from the chat and then uh, raised hand and I'll start going back and forth. Is it okay to de-thatch de lawns pre-May for no mow May? Sure. I don't, I don't know that that will certainly, um, I guess it depends on if you do it or somebody else does it and how aggressively they do it. Um, but it's not like right now, before anything's really emerged, this is a fine time to do it. And then you just let your lawn do its thing and your no mow may should be fine. Um, once like clovers and violets and everything else starts to come up in your lawn, if you start to go at it, then uh, it's going to be a little, a little bit harder on the flowers and, and the plants themselves. But like, for instance, I've been watching the clover come up in people's yards and it's, it's so small right now that you could probably dethatch and not necessarily do any damage, but I wouldn't wait all the way till May. And if you do it at the end of May, yes, you can do it at the end of May. Uh, but then you, you kind of, kind of mess with whatever else you're trying to get established in there. So Vivian has your, I see your hand up. Um, you'll need to unmute. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, I was so excited by what you what you went over. I I've heard all sorts of uh, aspects of it before. You know, following Doug Tallamy, but uh, the way you uh, brought it home to us is is really exciting. And I'd like to know whether. Um, you have been involved in or, or know of any efforts uh, for schools and colleges that have land around them that are not, you know, just in dense urban areas. If they have land around them, are any of them doing biodiverse land care and landscapes as, as, as you are capable of, of, uh, of showing us, but are they listening and are they doing this in, in educational settings? So um, there are plenty of colleges that have adopted this. Other colleges, um, which I don't work with as much, I work a lot with elementary and high school. So with the elementary schools, mostly uh, we're working on, I build pollinator gardens. I teach 
uh, we build a, essentially a living laboratory. So uh, mm -hmm. the first graders learn all about the seed cycle. The second graders look, learn all about the pollinators. The fourth, uh, third graders are kind of outside of that, but they visit the garden and they kind of look at it for different things. Fourth grade is all soil uh, and soil erosion and fifth grade is all habitats. So like this one garden that gets created uh, really does handle K through five. Um, which is great. And I'm really working hard to get those in as many schools as possible. Uh, I, with YMCA and YMCA campuses, um, I've been working with them as well to create large kind of habitat gardens, not necessarily just pollinator gardens, but they're habitat gardens because we put a lot of bird friendly plants and the like in there. Um, and so those are like, those are the immediate projects that I'm working on. And then there are larger long-term projects for um, condo complexes and the, the the surrounding land on a condo complex and trying to just reclaim some of that and reduce the the maintenance, you know, the, the prescribed maintenance for it and let it not go wild and not be like dangerous and unkempt, but like I was talking about composed meadows. So creating these, these, uh, these areas that are wild, but are still accessible uh, for people because trying to like plug people back into the planet and connect people with nature really is like my underlying goal. So like Hopkinton's working on a lot of walking trails. Uh, I'm consulting on a number of Miyawaki forests. So those urban forest areas that you may have heard of. So I'm consulting on a number of those. So there's, there's a lot of great stuff happening. It's just happening at different paces. And many of the walls that we're hitting is just the old paradigm, you know? So you know, I tell everybody, this is the way we've always done it, is the most dangerous phrase in the English language. And that's what we are trying to get over right now, is just how do we, you know, how do we move past that? And how do we get campuses to be okay with knee and waist high, you know, meadows within their campus and not in this far remote corner, but someplace where people can observe it? Because we've learned especially in the in the in the elementary schools you can you can incorporate language arts you can incorporate science you can incorporate music if you'd like you know all so many uh, all of that can just be tied into and then you can start talking about indigenous cultures and the like in their relationships so there is a lot happening slowly but surely and any help that uh i that i can get is is certainly welcome any any guidance any direction if you know a project put me on it. If you work with a school, put me on it. Um, I'm more than happy to kind of get these things going. Thank you. You got it, Vivian. Thank you. Great. Um, folks, I want to tell you, we won't have time to get to everybody, but we'll keep taking questions until we get to 830. Um, so we have one. Any suggestions for planting on a leach field? Uh, okay. So I am a big fan, depending on the town you're in, but I uh, just had a Long, long consultation with the town of Sherburn and their health department. And they have now been convinced as I'm willing to talk to anybody's town that a composed meadow or what I'm calling a septic meadow, which isn't a very sexy term, but it is what it is, um, is a, a great alternative to just throwing down grass seed because in creating a septic system or a septic area, you have a lot of subsoil. So you have this crap soil, which the native plants will love but this, the turf that they try you try to get growing there uh, doesn't actually thrive with. So um, create using that opportunity and that space to create a, a wildlife garden uh, is great. You can't grow shrubs, and there are certain um, rules and regulations. <clears throat> excuse me, to the height of the plants and the and the root depth of the plants you can use. But as I said, there's a native plant for everything. So there's plenty of native plants that you can create a wonderful meadow that will meet their height and the root requirements for a septic area. Great. Uh, Ellen, fine, would you like to ask your question? Please, thanks. I just love this, Trevor, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm almost gonna kind of dare you to come to Needham. <laughs> sure. We are tear downtown. Um, yeah. It's so bad that there's a local band called the Teardowns, um, which means, as you know, every one of these Teardowns is a McMansion, sod, pesticide, leaf blowers, yep, everywhere. 
so I'm kind of having a question here, you know, as I try to shift my berm garden. And by the way, I think you saw my post that said we had 250 homes flood. Um, you know, when you tear down all the trees yep. and the, it, it's, it's just a natural. So, you know, as I want to be planting more pollinator um, friendly native plants, I have this intense pain and guilt inside because my neighbor here, there, 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 and there are all using pesticides. And I'm like, is it right for me to attract these pollinators into my, you know, yard when the next yard that they're going to go to, or they're going to get blitzed from, you know, the 25 neighbors of mine who are spraying pesticides? So I'm going to say yes, because you're doing the right thing. I'm going to say yes, because Buckminster Fuller says that if you want to make any change, you know, you're not going to do it by fighting the way that things currently are. You need to create a new model to make the old model obsolete. So by creating a, na a beautiful native plant landscape, maybe your neighbors will start adopting that. And by creating, I mean, not everybody around me here in Arlington does all of the right thing. But as I said, like my little area, my little postage stamp, and it really is a postage stamp, has over the past three to five years become quite this, quite the sanctuary. Um, you know, because I've made sure that I have everything that the, the all you know that the birds need and the insects need, etc. Um, so, it I I would say yes, go ahead and do it, and yes, do the best you can and provide the best you can, and at the same time. What I would, I do, what I suggest nobody do is plant shame or tell anybody they're doing it wrong. Talk about how excited you are that you have this many birds and this many pollinators and you have these beautiful plants. Show people and get them to want to do that. Because if you tell somebody, don't use that plant, that's that's the wrong plant, unless it's an invasive. But if you're just telling somebody who like might use that perennial hibiscus that's a non-native, if you say, don't use that plant, that's the wrong thing to do, then they're just going to double down. But if you show somebody this beautiful, colorful garden that you have, then you'll be able to change them. But the fact that you're trying to do what you're doing and you're surrounded by people who may may not be doing it ecologically, you know, ecologic in an ecological manner. If you stopped doing it, now you've created a desert. At least you're trying. And at least you've created this oasis. And then hopefully the more people who jump on, now you're going to create a green corridor or you're going to create an entire kind of, you know, larger ecosystem, but it needs to start somewhere. So I very much applaud the fact that you are at least trying, uh, even though you're in a, in a sea, you might be in a sea of chemicals, at least you are trying and you are providing some sort of sanctuary and nutritional value for the birds and the pollinators. Thank you. And I, I will be reaching out to you. And unfortunately, I got quite ill from several of these pesticide exposures. So, mm -hmm. um, and I have tried reaching people on that level. And doesn't matter to them at all. <laughs> well, it's an education thing. I mean, people don't understand that just by having healthy soil, you're not going to need all of those those of fungicides and all of those other things. And if you stop using them, then you're actually going to get that healthy soil. And it's an education piece. And that's why I love doing this, because, you know, the more I can educate everybody who's on here, maybe you can pass it on to somebody else. Or maybe somebody on here is like, oh, I didn't know that. And now they're going to do something different. So it's it's all we can do. All we can do is what we can do, but we certainly have to try. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anna. You need to unmute. Yeah. There you go. Um, okay. Speaking of education, I, I was thrilled that you're working with elementary school kids. And I wondered, because I am working with schools, if you have a written guide or a curriculum for what you're doing in your schools? There is. There's a field guide um, that we are continuing. Like we're, we're tweaking it now. Um, hopefully it'll be totally done. Like we had last two years ago, we came out with the beta version. Uh, now it's, it's looking pretty good, but we're tweaking it up. But we do have uh, a field guide and kind of a, a three class curriculum for the second grade. And we're working on it for all the others. So like all the other grades are more of like, a, they're still a, a work in progress based on the standards. So we're going in and we're presenting on soils, but uh, I don't have a field guide for the soil class yet. I have, a, I've done six 
seven different pollinator gardens. So there is a, a field guide and a comprehensive kind of curriculum built around that and just working on the rest of it. Unfortunately, there's this landscape season that just keeps kind of getting in my way every time I start to pick up speed. <laughs> and managing standards is not easy either. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. Uh, could you send that to the Pollinator Network? That would be the link. That would be wonderful. Uh, yeah, I can try to get something like that out there to you. Or, or how we can find it on your material. So Okay, perfect. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank this you. was a wonderful talk. And I also made a note in the chat that I'm also going to set, um, share at least the introduction to your talk with the uh, steering committee of the master plan for our small town, uh, because it really gives us the scope of what is coming. And that is one of the most difficult things to get across to the public is that we cannot plan 15 years in the future, like we used to plan for 15 years. No, we don't. I, we don't. Unfortunately, we don't necessarily have that much time. In 15 years, you know, one of those bees that I was talking about could go all the way extinct. So, uh, okay. we have to be a little more proactive than that. But yeah, I mean, if anybody on here, you know, I'm happy to speak to anybody's group or anybody's town. I spoke to the town of Sherburne. I spoke to the town of Holliston. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, large groups like that and whole towns, you know, are wonderful because you get a lot of people who are where you're not preaching to the choir. There might be some people on there yes, that absolutely. People certainly don't know at all, so. Yeah, um, I, I uh, have a couple of questions. I, I know a lot about this topic, but I have a couple of questions still. Sure. So, um, one of them is, is the, is that, is that I, I'm going to be living in a place with just a balcony soon, and I grow oyster mushrooms. Yep. Uh, the oyster mushrooms have leftover water from when I water them. I need to get rid of somewhere. And I don't know if it will harm the tomato plants to put it on them or other I would, I wouldn't necessarily water the leaves, but watering the soil is not going to harm them at all. And so I wonder, like, like so it's so like, even if the water had sat there for like 20, 30 minutes or even a day or two. Nope, it's fine. Uh, it's absolutely fine. In fact, if it sits, you know, the, if it's if you're using tap water and it's got chlorine in it, the longer it sits, the better it is for your plants because the chlorine off gases and then you're not you're not um jeopardizing or messing with the soil microbiome. So the longer, you know, if, if you can get the chlorine out of your tap water. Or if you can use it and filter it through, you know, through your mushrooms and let it sit for a bit, then use it. It'll be much better for your tomato plant in the long run. Oh well, that's good to know. Oh, um, the other question is, I work in Hatfield and we're going to, and hopefully I'll get back to work in time to start a pollinator meadow at where I work. Yeah. But, I. I, and the intention is that it'll be a, for pollinators will also be for harvesting hay for oyster mushrooms to grow yeah. in, in, but the closest place I know of to Hatfield to buy the seeds would be Hadley or Greenfield, and that's a bit of a drive. Is there a closer place, or would you suggest that we just drive that far? Um. Well, I mean, I'm a huge fan of trying to get um local seed if you if you can and i'm a huge fan of supporting you know local businesses and so and local, local seed and local businesses etc um big you know big fan of that you certainly can there are you know many online bulk seed sources yeah. you know, that you could use that are going to give you great seed they'll still give you organic seed um it's just you know like i said it's just it's just out there so yeah, gardeners whittle down. Go ahead. Up in Greenfield are the places I was thinking of getting seed from, but they are a few towns away from where I work. So I wondered if, wondered if there's a closer town to get seed. I, from. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't necessarily know uh, what would be close to you, to to certainly to get into and get the seed that you're looking for. Okay, so then 
just go to one of those those places that's a few towns away. Sure, I mean, is I mean, is is what is what Chusett or Winchester, uh, Westminster, close to you? I'm not familiar with like that area where you are. So Westminster, uh, there's no. a great agway out there that has all the seed that you could look for. No, oh, so, oh. I'm sorry. So Trevor, I'm wondering if maybe you would just throw your email in the chat so um, sure, Scully yeah. can yeah. email you and get some yeah. questions. And I just want to thank everybody so much. I'll let Amy close it up, but I, I will be sending the recording out to everyone who re um, registered for the event. So you will be getting that recording and you can share it. Excellent. And thank Amy, you. I will turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Trevor, so much. Really was a great talk. And I'm having trouble saving the chat, Renee. If you could do that, that would be wonderful because Trevor, oh, yeah. you're I've got it. what people said. And thanks everyone for coming and for having questions and for caring about all this. There's a lot we can do to make things better, as Trevor has told us. So thanks. We really, really appreciate your sharing all your knowledge. And we'd love to have you back. I know you have other areas of expertise, too, that we'd be interested in. Certainly. I'd love. I'd, I'd definitely love to come back. And I hope some of you will join uh, Tuesday nights, 6 to 7, because that'd be great, too. We can continue this conversation. So I appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, Thank you, you, Trevor. Have a wonderful yeah. evening. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Okay.